Hi, my name is Amanda Weeman. I'm the pharmacy director at a small specialty hospital here in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the clinical pharmacy services offered at our facility and to tell you more about what clinical pharmacists can do for you as providers. There seems to be a lot of misconceptions about what exactly is the role of a pharmacist? What is their job? Why do they get paid so much? And some of the common questions that I receive are, what, do you just count pills all day? Why does it take so long for me to get my medications? Can't you just slap the label on the vial? The role of the hospital pharmacist is even more misunderstood. Typically, the hospital's pharmacy is relegated to the basement with no windows, behind locked doors, and it's really not very often that the pharmacists make their way out to the floors to interact with the providers. But I'm hoping that after today's presentation, you'll understand that we do more than just push a verify button and dispense medications. Before I begin telling you about some of the services we provide, I'd like to give you a background on pharmacist education. And it's changed within the last 10 to 15 years. Um, pharmacists are required to complete at least two years of an undergraduate program. A lot of pharmacy schools are now requiring an undergraduate degree to be accepted into pharmacy school. And pharmacy schools provide a doctor to pharmacy. Um, there's three-year programs and four-year programs. The three-year programs are typically accelerated and go throughout the summer. So essentially it's a four-year doctorate degree for a pharmacist. Many pharmacists are choosing to take additional training in a residency program. Um, the first year of a residency is just general hospital training. Second year is a specialty training residency, um, typically in critical care, infectious diseases, transplant, those types of, of settings. There's also fellowship programs and specialty training and board certifications that pharmacists can undergo. The additional education provides more clinical background for the pharmacist. Our role is moving from a dispensing and verification role to a clinical role. And this allows us to provide additional services to the providers and to patients. The services that we provide at our hospital include anticoagulation monitoring, antimicrobial stewardship, kinetics, management of anemia, pain management, TPN management, and a new program, minimizing chemical restraints. So I'm going to delve into each one of these and give you a better idea of how the pharmacist can provide services. With anticoagulation, um, you're probably well aware that warfarin, heparin, lovenox, they're all very high risk medications. The Joint Commission has national patient safety goals that require monitoring and reporting of any adverse events that are occurring with these medications. At our facility, the pharmacists are monitoring every one of these patients on um, warfarin, heparin, lovenox, looking at lab values, making recommendations for changing doses, um, and then also providing education to patients to ensure that they're safe at home when they're discharged on the medication. While most hospitals have some sort of pharmacy-driven anticoagulation program, not too many hospital pharmacies are involved with antimicrobial stewardship. At our, our site, our pharmacists are reviewing every patient started on an antibiotic or an antimicrobial and reviewing the cultures and sensitivities. We work very closely with our ID physicians to recommend appropriate de-escalation therapy and the, the goal in doing this is to prevent future antimicrobial resistance. We're also rounding with the ID physicians, checking for signs and symptoms of infection, and making sure that patients that don't require any additional line days are having their central lines removed. The pharmacists has, have also been very involved in kinetics monitoring and renal dosing. Um, any medication that started that requires a special dosing adjustment is automatically going to be changed by the pharmacy. And this is um, an initiative that the Medical Executive Committee has approved. Um, there's not any additional calls to the physician that are required. The doses are just being adjusted per guidelines. Another thing that's special to our site 
just based on our large renal population, we have a lot of patients that require special anemia management. Um, pharmacists are looking at hemoglobins, hematocrits, and patients' iron stores to make sure that we are limiting the number of blood transfusions that our renal patients would be requiring. Um, Aranesp is our erythropoietin stimulating agent of choice, and there's a black box warning to go along with that, suggesting that there's an increased risk of thromboembolism with patients on these medications. Um, so what the pharmacists are doing is basically ensuring that based on lab values, um, we're using the, the doses correctly and we're using the drug appropriately. Um, you can also imagine with our long-term patients, there's a lot of um, chronic management of pain that's required. And what we're seeing is patients are often transferred from outside hospitals. They come in on fentanyl, Dilaudid, Oxy. They're on everything under the sun. And what they really require is a streamlining of their therapy. We want to reduce the potential of over-sedation, um, respiratory depression, and make it a little bit easier for, for our physicians to be able to discharge our patients. Um, we know that a patient can't go home receiving you know, eight doses of IV Dilaudid. We have to have a better plan of care. So whether it's a long-acting fentanyl patch or a sustained release tablet of some sort, the pharmacists are making these recommendations to physicians of how we can better control pain in these difficult-to-treat patients. One thing to note with our pain management program is that it does require a pharmacy consult. This is not something that the pharmacists are automatically intervening with. In our attempt to get pharmacists more involved with other disciplines, um, total parenteral nutrition is one example of how the dietitians work very closely with pharmacy to manage patients' nutritional needs. We have the pharmacists review electrolytes and blood glucose levels every day of patients on TPN. The pharmacists make all of the necessary micronutrient adjustments and send off these um, orders to an outside pharmacy for um, individual compounding of the TPNs. One of the newest services that we're providing is an attempt to minimize chemical restraints. Beginning October 1st, the state of Arizona is now requiring physicians have informed patient consent documentation for any new psychotropic agent that started on a patient. And with this, the question arises, are we over-medicating our patients? Are there alternatives that we could be using other than chemically restraining them? And with this process, the pharmacists are verifying indications for medications like antipsychotics and benzodiazepines, and they're working with physicians on a plan of care to minimize the duration of use of these agents. We know that there's an increased risk of mortality when antipsychotics are used in elderly patients in this type of environment. Um, so we want to make sure that there's a plan of care in place and that everybody is working towards minimizing use of these agents. So I hope I've provided you with a little information of what our pharmacists can do. I encourage you to come visit the pharmacy and meet the pharmacists that are there. And anytime you feel that your patient may benefit from pharmacist management of medications, please do not hesitate to put in a pharmacy consult. Thank you so much.